Early in my training, I'd sometimes worry. I'd worry about the medical conditions I'd never treated. I'd worry about the diseases I'd never diagnosed. I'd worry about the resuscitations I was yet to face. One night as an intern in a small hospital as the only doctor, I remember the realization that my patient was going to die. Unless, unless I could intubate them and unless I could pace up her blocked heart. Even now, I can still see my shaking hand gripping that laryngoscope. I still remember that feeling, that haunted feeling of fear, because I'd never done emergency pacing before. And I remember the relief and the gratitude I had to the nurses who helped me make it happen. Another night, another hospital, but I was still the junior doctor. And this time in front of me is a young indigenous woman, and she's dying. She had severe rheumatic heart disease. She had severe mitral stenosis, and she had florid pulmonary edema. She'd collapsed in the bathroom. She'd collapsed after a miscarriage or a birth I wasn't sure which at the time, in the toilet. So there was a dead or dying baby in the toilet. And I did, <laughs> I did everything I could. And our team, we did everything we could, and it wasn't enough. I remember more than anything, wanting to be the kind of doctor that could handle clinical situations like these. And now, after all my years of registrar training, five years as an intensivist, to be honest, the clinical stuff in those types of situations, they're not usually what worries me. And that's because our training is geared to help us rule the resus room. We see case after case, we iteratively learn, we gradually gain knowledge and skill. Somehow, subconsciously, in those situations, we learn to re react, accept, reset, and engage. And of course, we've had some great teachers along the way, too. You know who I'm going to say. <laughs> People like the, the late John Hines. So if you're about to crack the chest, forget about the indications and the time scales and who decided what the downtime was. Ask yourself, are my intentions honorable? Do I think I can bring this person back? I think we've overcomplicated this as a procedure. This is not hard. Making two holes in the chest, joining them up, opening the pericardium, and sticking a finger in the hole is not a difficult thing to do. So what challenges me now? It's when I can't fix things with actions. It's when problem solving doesn't solve the problem. It's when there's a clash of personalities. It's when clinical tribes go to war. It's when there's a trainee or a colleague who, despite desperately doing their best, fall short, and I have to give them feedback. It's when people I care about are hurting, and it's when, after a failed resuscitation, the telephone's put in my hand, and I'm told that my dead patient's mother is on the line. I know what challenges me. How about you? So we'd like to do our best to help you take the kinds of experiences that Chris is talking about, which we can imagine many of you share, and think about how you can best handle those. 
So if you wish, you could just lower your gaze for a moment or close your eyes and think about the kind of situation, feel into the kind of situation that Chris just brought up, except your version. Once you have that in mind, what we want to think about together is how do we manage this effectively? And fortunately, the social science of neuro Psych neuropsychology of learning can really help us with this situation. And what we've learned is if we can embody these situations, it helps us really learn. So we're going to invite you to join with us in this concept of react, accept, reset, and then engage to bring these days of learning that you've taken and take it home with you in an effective way. So what we need to do is embody that. So I'm going to demonstrate this for you briefly. And those of you who kindly recorded a rare video last night, if you would like to stand up and help in the audience, we'd love your assistance. And then I'm going to unpack a little bit why are we doing this. So the moves that we think would be helpful in difficult interpersonal situations or clinical ones are the following. And follow along with me if you want to, or we'll have a chance to do it again in a moment. So it is react and tense. Accept, release, reset, and breathe, and then engage, step forward. So what is the method in this madness here? What we know is that it's very natural for us to react when we are challenged interpersonally, when somebody gives us a comment that makes us feel defensive or angry when we have a clinical situation that makes us feel afraid. The challenge is these reactions tend to be turbo-fueled by our amygdala. So when fear takes over, when we make attributions about the other person, that they're an idiot, it makes it exceptionally difficult for us to access our resources, and our brain starts sort of constricting. So when you have that reaction, the next step is to accept it, because judging your judging is not going to help you feel any better. And that acceptance process allows you to start bypassing, bystanding those emotions, and making them part of an information system rather than an emotionally driven flood for your brain. The next step is going to be thinking about how do you reset. So I have to say, as an organizational behavior scholar, I think it is the height of hubris for me to be talking to an auditorium of critical care providers about how to reset. Because the worst thing that's going to happen in my world if I don't reset effectively is somebody's feelings are going to get hurt. <laughs> in your world, though, I imagine you have a mantra, or you have a routine, or you have something that you use to reset. So please bring that to bear in this next step, as you wish. So what I'd like to ask you to do now is think of that confronting situation you might have thought of as Chris was speaking, or you could think of another one. And if you just take a moment and talk with your neighbor, there's two reasons. One, sometimes we don't know what we think till we see what we say. But the other reason is we're collectively building a little micro moment of community here that you can bring forward to those moments when you need rare in the future. So if you just take 30 seconds and share with your uh, neighbor a confronting situation where you might use rare from the past or something you might face in the future. OK, I'm going to go on from here. So if you'd kind of hold that moment in mind, for example, I was just coming on stage a few minutes ago thinking about talking with all of you, and you can imagine my heart rate went up, and a number of my palms were clammy, and I was thinking to myself, oh, react, okay, accept, reset, engage. So that's maybe the moment you could be in right now, too, something that was challenging for you. So what we'd like you to think about now in your reset routine is the autonomic nervous system superpower reset of breathing. Many of you may already use this. The other physiological thing that you might consider as you reset is that we've learned that our outside often shapes our inside. 
So there may be a reason why the Buddha is always pictured with a little smile upon his face. It's because it's his rare. So you could maybe allow a little Mona Lisa smile to come to your face. Now recognize if you're in the middle of the ICU and somebody thinks you're smirking, that may not exactly work. <laughs> but maybe there's some subtle way that you can do that. The third physiological thing I'd like you to consider is what we heard from Liz Crow the other day, which is the power of empathy. So if you're reacting to a colleague who's very challenging somehow, if you can find it in your heart to wonder where they're coming from and have some empathy for them, even temporarily, that actually is going to help you self-regulate. Empathy for others helps us calm down. So once you've breathed, maybe smiled, maybe tried to feel a little empathy. The last part of this puzzle is a cognitive reframe, and I talked with many of you about this in Berlin a few years ago, which is this idea of when you're thinking, what the fuck is this other person doing? That is an opportunity to reframe and think to yourself, what might be their frame? What's going on with them? So once you've reset, the last bit is to engage. So, when we step forward, once we've got ourselves back in a place where our prefrontal cortex is running the show rather than our amygdala, it's not only about stepping forward, it's about connecting. It's about starting the ball rolling in an improvisational routine of working with other people such that we can care, with our, care for our patients, or following an algorithm, or listening with compassion. So what I'd like to do now is have us all give this a try, if you're willing. So everybody, if you would be so good as to stand up, if you wish, and those of you who are in chairs that you keep you there, please just follow along to the best of your ability. Make sure you flip up the seat behind you so you have plenty of room, gives you about 18 inches. <laughs> and we're going to do three reps here so that we can all get this down. And so, if you would, follow along with me. So the first thing is react, head back and tense. Accept, step back and release. Did I just make a mistake? No. Nope. Uh, reset, <laughs> breathe, turn your palms out, and then engage, however you wish. So you can imagine doing this at the foot of the bed at a reset, recess or in a seeing that you're outside the hospital, or possibly with a family of a critically ill patient. It might look different in any of these settings. Okay, here we go. Our second rep, react, accept, reset, engage. And our last one, react, accept, reset. Engage. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for trying that. I'm hoping you'll be able to look inward and move forward using that. Thank you, Jenny. I, f I feel uh, reset and ready to engage after that. But it's easy to, be, to feel inspired at SMAC, isn't it? Because we're surrounded by friends, old and new, and we're connected. We're connected by a thirst for learning. We're connected by a burning desire to help each other be better and do better. But that counts for nothing, does it? Unless, unless we can take what we've learned and reflect on it and go back to our workplaces and make a difference. We need to carry the fire from smack. We need to keep the torches burning. Each of us needs to be like Prometheus who stole fire from the gods and gave it to everyone. We've looked inward, now we need to take it forward. We need to move forward. That's our shared challenge. And so as the sun sets on this last ever smack, when people ask you what happened, what was it all about, don't answer. Remember the words of Epictetus. He said, do not explain your philosophy, embody it. I challenge you to ask yourselves, 
Are you the sort of people that will go away and make a difference? Are you the sort of people that will go away and react, accept, reset, and engage? Use what you have learned to become the clinicians that you want to be. Use what you have learned to become the clinicians that your patients need you to be. And I thank you all for being the SMAC family. Thank you.